What are you going to do when the first seal of revelation breaks? Is it possible that Jesus gave us specific instructions on how to overcome during each individual year of the 70th week of Daniel? Instructions that have been overlooked and ignored for 2,000 years, but now the church is going to need them. And in this episode, we will begin to reveal those specific directions from the mouth of Jesus himself. For those 2,000 years, the letters to the seven churches have masqueraded as only historic letters to the first century churches that is good advice at any time. And, of course, it is good advice at any time. Others think that perhaps they are prophetic of church ages. However, as we learned in the previous video on the seven churches, they cannot be prophetic of church ages. And although they were advice from Jesus to seven first century churches, they carry a prophetic meaning as well. If you miss that crucial initial episode, click on the playlist in the banner or on the link down in the description after this video is over. In that last video, we proposed a shocking theory that each letter is for a specific time period or year of the 70th week of Daniel so the church can know how to overcome and endure it. As each seal on the seventh sealed scroll is opened in Revelation 6 through 8, conditions on the earth will change and change rapidly. These letters instruct the church on how to overcome in the midst of those changes. Now that's just fine for us to say. But since this theory is less than 10 years old, and since you have probably never heard it before, I'm sure you'd like some evidence, some proof. So let's show you a brief snapshot of how the events in each seal match up with the instructions in each letter. Then, after demonstrating that, we will begin to look at the amazing details in each letter. But before we begin to look at even the first seal, we need to also remind ourselves that the order and events of each seal in Revelation 6 matches up exactly with the aspects of Jesus' Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. That is a pattern of seven events in the exact order in both books of the Bible. Deception by false messiahs and prophets, bloodshed, war, and chaos, then economic collapse and famine, followed by abomination and death, then martyrdom, witness and apostasy, celestial signs, and finally wrath. In this previous video from last year, we examined this order and actually uncovered that there were 13 events in exactly the same order. And we discussed the odds of this being random was approximately three trillion to one. So it obviously is not a random order. Now, Based on that understanding, let's compare the events of each seal with each letter from 10,000 feet above it. After we look at this generalized comparison, we can begin to dig in to the incredible details that Jesus has placed in each letter. When the first seal opens, its primary focus is on deception by false prophets and messiahs who attempt to spiritually overcome the world. The word for this in Revelation 6-2 is Nikao. In your Bible, you may read, he came conquering and to conquer, but the main meaning elsewhere in scripture of this word is overcoming. In the letter to Ephesus, the first letter, we see the church commended for uncovering false religious leaders just like these, and for hating the deeds of a group called the Nicolaitans, a word derived from Nikao, meaning overcome just as in Revelation 6-2, and laity meaning people, the overcomers of the people. Pretty interesting comparison, huh? After the second seal, the world experiences war, rumors of war, struggles between ethnic groups and nations, and peace is taken from the earth. It is also our opinion that this is the year the temple sacrifices begin on a regular basis. In the second letter, 
the letter to Smyrna, Jesus speaks of martyrdom during this period and also of a blasphemy by Jews who are of the synagogue of Satan. Is this blasphemy the temple sacrifices? We believe it is. After the third seal, we see economic collapse, price fixing, and famine. And in the third letter to Pergamum, Jesus criticizes this church for eating food sacrificed to idols, but offers the faithful some of his hidden manna. Both are economic and famine related issues. After the fourth seal is opened, death is given authority to kill over a quarter of the earth. This is the beginning of the great tribulation. In the fourth letter, Jesus promises authority over the nations to those who overcome and threatens to throw some of this church into that same great tribulation. After the fifth seal is broken, we see martyrdom, witness, and apostasy. And in the fifth letter, the letter to the fifth church, the letter to Sardis, we see death. It's called the dead church. Now martyrdom is the physical death of the faithful, apostasy is the spiritual death of those who fall away. And Jesus instructs the faithful to witness during this difficult part of the great tribulation, to strengthen the things that remain. In other words, to strengthen the brothers and sisters still alive who have not yet fallen away or not yet been martyred. After the sixth seal, the celestial signs appear in the sky and Jesus gathers the elect Christians to be with him in what we commonly term the rapture. In the letter to Philadelphia, the sixth letter, Jesus uses the key of David to open the door to heaven and keeps Christians from the hour of testing, which of course is the wrath of God. And this keeping them from the wrath of God is the rapture. After the seventh seal, the wrath of God falls upon the earth. Is there still a church on the earth at that time? Yes, the apostate church. Now the seventh letter, the letter to the church of Laodicea, means trial of the people. And it involves this trial of those without saving faith, those who were not worthy to go with Jesus in the rapture. Jesus tells them he wishes they were hot or cold, but not lukewarm. This phrase is commonly misunderstood, but it means he wishes they were hot and had saving faith or cold and were totally unrighteous and worthy to be destroyed. But as it is, they had some level of faith and thus find themselves in the year of God's wrath. And yet, Jesus knocks on the door and entreats them to still come to true faith before the end. So hopefully after this one minute tour of the seven letters, you can see there is a level of connection between each letter and each seal. Hopefully this has whetted your appetite to learn all the incredible details and connections Jesus has built into these letters, which of course all mimic the seven seals. So without further delay, in this video, let's begin by looking at the letter to Ephesus, the first letter. Just as we mentioned, the first letter is a letter of instruction to the church of Jesus Christ, the one and only church of Jesus Christ, immediately upon the breaking of the first seal of Revelation and the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. This letter is structured just like all the other seven. First, at the beginning of every letter, we are told the name of the church. And in this case, in the case of the first letter, it's Ephesus. Now, although the meaning of this name is debated, it is generally thought that Ephesus means the desired one. This name reflects the immense spiritual battle that is about to take place on the earth. God and Satan both desire the souls of believers. All of the 70th week of Daniel will revolve around this battle. After the breaking of the first seal, 
Satan's counterfeit messiahs and false prophets will burst upon the world scene. The conflict for the souls of believers will be between the false messiahs and the true messiah Jesus. Now, in Revelation 6-2, as we learned earlier in this video, the rider of the white horse comes to conquer, which is the Greek word nakao, which literally means to overcome spiritually, to deceive them. The battle lines are drawn for the desired one. At the time John wrote Revelation, Ephesus was the crown jewel of Asia Minor, a rich and highly pagan city. Their economy centered on the worship of Artemis, the moon goddess. For those of you interested in Islamic connections, remember the Islamic god Allah is the moon god. Now Artemis was also the goddess of fertility. She was a huntress and skilled with a bow. Recall that the rider of the white horse also carries a bow. The temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Many of her worshipers deposited their savings with the priests, trusting that the goddess would protect them. It was an early form of banking a robust industry of manufacture of Artemis idols supported the town as well. At the center of the temple of Artemis was her image, a black meteorite that fell to the earth. It's mentioned in the book of Acts. After quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, men of Ephesus, what man is there, after all, who does not know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven. In my very first book, Are We Ready for Jesus? We discussed how this very meteorite is likely currently on the Kaaba in Mecca. It is the most holy item in Islam. We also discussed at length that this black stone contrasted with the white stone of Jesus in the letter to Pergamum might possibly be the image of the beast mentioned in Revelation 13, and in a future video, we'll discuss this in more depth. We also learn from Acts that during Paul's time in Ephesus, his teaching so disrupted the trade of idols that a great riot broke out. A silversmith named Demetrius said, men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into dispute, disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she, whom all of Asia and the world worship, will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Artistachus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Church history relates that Timothy, who was bishop of Ephesus and the protege of Paul, was martyred by Artemis worshipers, who were chanting this exact same phrase, Great is Artemis. I can almost hear a modern crowd crying out Allah Akbar or greatest is Allah instead of great is Artemis when I read this passage. The parallels to Islamic Sharia blasphemy laws seem striking. Will Christians be dragged into city courts for blasphemy against Allah at some point in the 70th week of Daniel? Perhaps. So from the name of the town and from history, we learn that a struggle between the true God and false gods was taking place, much as today's struggle in our modern world. After the church's name, in each of the seven letters, the symbolic attributes of Jesus' appearance are mentioned. In this letter, it is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. In our last video, we mentioned that Jesus himself 
defined what both of these aspects of his appearance meant. We learned the seven stars are the angels of each church. Now, are these human messengers or true angels? We simply aren't told. However, a question favoring human messengers might be, why would Jesus write to angels that stand right before him in heaven? So, I favor human messengers, but I'm not dogmatic about it. Either way, God holds these angels in his right hand. The right hand is the hand of blessing. Israel blessed Ephraim with his right hand in Genesis 48:14. God's right hand is the place of power. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Jesus will use these angels to help shatter the deception by his enemies by the revelation of his word. And he will bless these messengers. Huh, what an awesome privilege and reward. Notice that in the letter to the church of Ephesus, it stated that Jesus walks among the lampstands. Jesus will be right there with us as we endure and overcome. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. These aspects of Jesus' appearance are appropriate for the first year, since they're kind of introductory. This first year is an entering in to the final act, to the final era of life on earth as we currently know it. And these aspects of Jesus' appearance act as encouragement for all seven years of the 70th week. Now, after Jesus' appearance, each letter then gives the condition of the church. For most of the seven years, Jesus provides both positive and negative feedback. This is what our Lord says will be the positive aspects of the church in the first year of the 70th week of Daniel. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and that you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. The primary condition of the world during that first year of the 70th week will be deception by false messiahs. It appears from this passage that the church is initially able to test and then recognize the false messiahs and false prophets as liars. The Greek word here is pseudius, translated as false, but it means lying or liar. This is the same root word as used in 1 John in this famous verse about the Antichrist, who is the liar, but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. The letter to Ephesus speaks of apostles. So is this passage saying in the future someone will appear claiming to be one of the twelve apostles? I, I don't think so. The word apostle means one sent as an emissary. I think we can assume this is a more generalized meaning, as multiple people claiming to be an emissary for God will appear at this time, as we know, from Matthew 24, 4-5, both false prophets and false messiahs. Islam is expecting Isa, who will claim to be the historic Jesus, just not a divine Jesus, but rather a Muslim one. Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims are each also expecting their own version of the Mahdi, the Muslim Savior. And Jews are expecting two messiahs of their own, Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. Ben Joseph being a suffering messiah and ben David being a kingly one, not realizing. But the one true messiah incorporated both of these aspects. So just imagine the conflict. If these five false messiah characters all appeared on the world stage at approximately the same time, Imagine the conflict between them. This is some of what we imagine might take place. And Jesus commends the church, however, for being able to sort these guys out. 
at least at first, at the breaking of the first seal. Jesus also commends the church of Ephesus for hating the works of the Nicolaitans. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. In our last video, we discussed this word, Nicolaitans, although there is a lot of conjecture about historic groups that fill this role. The name Nicolaitans appears to be derived from those two Greek words as we stated earlier, Nikao, meaning overcome, and Lykos, meaning the people. So in combination, overcoming the people. And Christians are not to hate the group. We are to love our enemies, but only to hate their actions. And this group is tied to the actions of the rider of the white horse as well, whose conquering in Revelation 6-2 is the Greek word nikao, a spiritual overcoming. By this, we determine the Nicolaitans here are followers of the Antichrist, or at least of the false messiahs and prophets, and their deceptive religions, who are attempting to overcome the people of the world, and especially the church. Jesus also commends the church of Ephesus for their perseverance. The Greek word for perseverance is hupomone, which is sometimes translated as endurance. This is the identical Greek word found in Jesus' explanation of the parable of the sower, which is, we are going to find out is critical to understanding Jesus' call for those who have ears to hear that appears at the end of every letter. But the seed in the good soil these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance, hupomone. Bearing fruit in the coming trial will require endurance. Additionally, the trial will help produce this type of endurance. We also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, hupomone. This is one purpose of Daniel's 70th week, the refining of the Bride of Christ. Jesus has only one rebuke for the church of Ephesus, but it's a really big one. A real big one. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. What is the church's first love? In Matthew, Jesus tells us, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost or first commandment. Bringing those attending our churches back into a love relationship is one purpose of the 70th week of Daniel. Jesus is clear that churchgoers will cease to be the church if they don't repent and act accordingly. They will fall away and apostatize. Entering the trial, the church will do works and will toil. For the Lord says, I know your deeds and your toil. The church will be expending a lot of effort but it will not be done through the love of Jesus. The effort is running in the wrong direction. Just a few verses later, we learn the church's works are not adequate. Jesus wants the church to do the deeds you did at first. Even though Jesus is aware of the effort of the church, expending in these good deeds, these deeds are not done in the right spirit. So the million dollar question. How does one love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? Loving God is not only shown through praying, going to a house of worship, praising him with a song, or giving a portion of your income to the church. To love God, it will take more than those religious acts. These are the type of good works that aren't enough that Jesus is talking about in a letter to Ephesus. Loving God is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in your life to help you accomplish the things that do produce this type of love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, we are told. And the New Testament actually has quite a lot to say about how he does this. The Holy Spirit empowers believers 
to be able to keep God's commandments. If you love me, keep my commands. John 14, 15. We need to love the brethren. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? 1 John 4, 20. Don't love material things. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 And we have to abide in him. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us. We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4.17 and 19 So the Holy Spirit creates a love for God and others by our constantly abiding in him. Now the great conflict of the first seal is either loving God or loving the things of the world and Satan's man who provides them, the Antichrist. Those who prepare as Jesus instructs them during this first seal by returning to our first love will be able to overcome all the other seals. Jesus' instructions here are the preparation for the harder trials yet to come. Jesus then concludes his letter with a promise to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 7. Every one of the letters ends with a promise, a promise that is seen fulfilled at the end of Revelation. This particular one is fulfilled in this way. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And the church of Ephesus discovered the false apostles, but in the New Jerusalem we see the true apostles, and the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So we have seen that the first seal is a preparatory one. But in the second seal, the temperature gets turned up. Wars and ethnic struggles and revolutions and peace is taken from the earth. If you want to keep watching to know what Jesus tells us to do during that time, well, click right here. And don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification so that you can be notified every time a new video like this one is released. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.